in a world where everyone is looking for your money up front, doesn't it just make sense to check out a podcast that's looking to give you something for free? Like the music for your content and free music for your film and videos? Look no further. It's the Tim Kulig Free Music Podcast. Hey everyone, it's Tim Kulig with the Tim Kulig Free Music Podcast. Been a bit of a time since I've put out a podcast. I think it's been since June, actually, when I interviewed John Bartman. We had a good time for a few hours there across the Atlantic. And yeah, uh, been a busy summer. I've been spending a lot of time putting together some music compilations. I'm working on some Christmas tunes right now. It's Today is actually October 3rd, 2024, and I am on a tear, really, to get past 700 tunes published. I am currently at 671, so it looks like I will be hitting that milestone and beyond before the end of the year, which would be fantastic, Uh, but it occurred to me I hadn't put out any content in a while in the podcast space, and I am gearing up to attend PodFest in Orlando in January 2025, so I need to get my chops back up and get more consistent about this content. So, that said, I am also on a tear and trying to experiment a little bit. And this week we're experimenting with the subject matter at hand, which is the history of copyright. Specifically, the history of copyright in the U.S. as it pertains to music, sheet music, performed music, written published the whole ball of wax and it spans from about the late 1700s until 2020 and the legislation that was put in place to protect creators like myself were their music compositions and performances and I have tagged and utilized a tool a newer tool called notebook lm to transcribe information from a outline that I produced of the series of events. It's about eight. And it's quite fascinating that from strictly an outline that Notebook LM was able to produce the following 12-minute treatise on the evolution of copyright law as it pertains to music in the U.S. So I hope you enjoy what it created. All right. Ready to dive into some serious legal waters. Sounds exciting. What are we tackling today? U.S. copyright law, specifically how it's shaped music as we know it. You all requested this deep dive into music copyright, so I know you already get how crucial this stuff is. This is not just for lawyers, right? Nope. We're talking about the backbone of the music biz, the stuff that makes the whole industry hum. From those very first copyrighted notes to... Well, today's streaming wars. Oh, yeah. There's a whole saga there. We're unpacking how tech and creativity have been, like, battling it out in court for ages. Trust me, there are some seriously unexpected twists coming up. But first, gotta set the stage. What makes this history so fascinating to you? What always gets me is it's this constant game of catch-up every time some new tech pops up. Which is, like, constantly, right. Right. Whether it was piano rolls back in the day or radio or now the whole Internet thing, copyright law has to scramble to protect musicians in this, like, brand new world. It never ends. A never-ending dance between the rule makers and the rule breakers. Exactly. All right. Let's rewind to the very beginning, then. The Big Bang of U.S. copyright law. Take us back to 1790. Okay, picture it. 1790, fresh ink on the very first Copyright Act. But, and this is a big but. Don't leave us hanging. It doesn't even mention music. Wait, seriously. So Mozart, Beethoven, all those guys, their work wasn't protected. What gives? It really shows you what mattered back then. They were all about maps, charts, books, the building blocks of a new nation, right? Music. An afterthought. Basically. It was entertainment, it's commercial value, what we think of today, totally off their radar. So sheet music hadn't hit the big time yet. Exactly. When did music finally get its big break in the copyright world then? Took a few decades, but finally, in 1831, the Copyright Act gets a makeover. And bam, music gets its own section. About time. Right. 
officially recognized composers' rights Ooh. who could copy their work, distribute it, the whole nine yards. So composers could finally be like, hey, that's mine. You can't just copy it. But what about actually performing the music, concerts, that kind of thing? Was that included? That's where it gets even more interesting. The whole idea of performance being its own thing, legally speaking. That was still being figured out. And like, is it the music on the page or playing it that matters more? Yeah. In 1856, they gave performance rights to plays, dramatic works. But music, left out in the cold. Seriously. So composers were just supposed to give out free concert tickets. What was the logic there? It seems like a real debate about what even was a musical work back then. Some said a live performance was just interpreting the written music. Not its own yeah. creation. Ah, so which came first, the music or the performance? Right. But that argument didn't last forever, did it? Thankfully, no. By 1897, common sense, or maybe they just heard a really good concert, they amended the act again. Music finally got those performance rights. I bet that was a game changer. Oh, huge. Musicians, their publishers, they could finally control and get this, get paid for public performances, concerts. The works. It's like the whole foundation of the music industry as we know it was being laid one copyright battle at a time. Right. But then, of course, technology had to throw a wrench in the works, didn't it? Always. Here comes the player piano. Exactly. And suddenly the rules had to change again. Yeah, it's like we've set the stage, got the main players, but the plot's about to thicken. You know. Oh, I'm ready for the next act. We're talking about recordings getting their own moment in the spotlight, right? Exactly. Before, it was all about the sheet music the underlying composition. Mm. But recordings, that was a whole new ball game, A unique performance, captured and shared in a whole new way. And the law had to play catch up. Big time. Think of it like reading a play versus seeing it live. Yeah. The 1971 Sound Recording Act, that was huge. It finally said, hey, these recordings, they're their own works of art. So performers, record labels, they could finally be like, this recording, our version, it's protected too. Not just the song itself. That's massive for the industry. Totally. Someone could cover the same song, put their own spin on it, and their recording had its own copyright. Recognize the creativity that goes into a performance. It's like the Beatles yesterday versus, I don't know, a punk rock version. Totally different vibe, different rights. Right. But of course, while all this is happening, another tech revolution is brewing. Uh-oh. What's technology up to now? Radio. Suddenly, music's flying through the airwaves, reaching everyone. No more needing to, like, be in the same room as the band to hear them? Exactly. And that created a whole new headache for copyright. Yeah. Imagine you're a composer, early 1900s. Your song's playing coast to coast. How do you even keep track, let alone get paid for each listen? Did musicians just have to accept that? Like, their music was just out there. That's where organizations like ASCAP stepped in. American Society Composers, Authors, and Publishers, formed in 1914. They're like, the original music police. Not exactly police. More like the negotiators. They acted as this go-between. Musicians on one side, anyone wanting to play their music publicly on the other. Sort of like the streaming services of today, but focused on making sure artists got paid. Exactly. They'd issue licenses, collect royalties, then distribute them fairly to their members. Musicians join forces, basically. Strengths and numbers, right. But I'm sensing a but coming. There's always a but. Yeah. Radio was just the beginning. Next came television. And, well, things got even more complicated. More tech, more problems, right. It's the story of copyright law. Television, then cable TV, set tapes, VCRs, to copy those tapes. Mm-hmm. It's like every few years, a new way to copy and share pops up. And the law is trying to keep up with who's allowed to copy what and who gets paid. Right. Take cable TV, for example. In 1972, they had to come up with this whole new thing. Compulsory licensing. Compulsory. That sounds kind of scary, like forced labor or something. Less dramatic than it sounds. Basically, cable providers could retransmit broadcast signals, music included, but they had to pay royalties. So not a free-for-all, but a compromise. Exactly. Finding that balance again. But little did they know, the biggest shakeup was still to come. And it wasn't on the airwaves. Oh, no. This one involved ones and zeros, dial-up modems. The internet changes everything. We're about to enter the digital age, folks, right after this. <laughs> All right. Buckling up for the digital age, I feel like things are about to get kind of meta, you know? Meta is the word. It wasn't just about listening to music differently anymore. The internet, it changed how we access, how we share, even how we think about creative work. Copyright law was playing catch-up, 
big time. It was the Wild West out there. Everyone downloading MP3s, Napster, that it felt revolutionary, but also nobody knew what the rules were anymore. Napster, that was a wake-up call for sure. Showed how easily digital music could be, well, copied. Existing laws just weren't ready. I'll admit, I was downloading back then, didn't think much of it. But for artists, it must have been scary. Losing control of their work, not getting paid. Huge problem. So in 95, you get the Digital Performance Right and Sound Recordings Act. Long name, big deal. Finally said, hey, digital transmissions, online streaming, that counts as a public performance. So even if you weren't selling CDs, if you were streaming it online, permission needed. And probably royalties, too. Exactly. That's the foundation for Spotify, Apple Music, all that. But it wasn't over. Peer-to-peer mm -hmm. -peer sharing, Napster and the like, people sharing without paying a cent. The music industry must have been freaking out. Cue the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. The DMCA. 1998. That was their attempt to wrangle the internet back under control. Copyright-wise, at least. The DMCA, that always had a kind of scary ring to it. It was big, that's for sure. One thing it did was go after those file-sharing sites, the Napsters of the world. How so? Made it illegal to get around those digital locks. You know, DRM, that stuff that tries to protect files online. And they created this thing called the Safe Harbor Provision. Safe Harbor? Sounds kind of nautical for the digital world. Right. It protected those online platforms, like your internet provider, websites, from getting sued constantly for what their users were doing. Ah, so they weren't responsible for every little thing people did on their platform. Exactly. But there were rules. They had to take down infringing stuff when they were told and have policies to discourage it, that kind of thing. A compromise, yeah. like always. But even with the DMCA, things didn't slow down, did they? Not even a little. Streaming took off, then YouTube, TikTok, now AI making music. Every year, there's a new challenge. Okay, so fast forwarding a bit into the 21st century now, what were some of the big legal wins for musicians that helped them keep up with all this change? 2018, big year. The Music Modernization Act gets passed. The MMA. The MMA, I remember that. Felt like a big deal for songwriters, especially in the age of streaming. It was. The goal was to make copyright work better in this digital world for everyone, especially making sure songwriters, composers, Everyone was getting paid fairly from streaming. Which seems really hard. You've got the platforms, the labels, the publishers, the artists themselves. Who gets what slice of the pie? And that was the problem. A lot of folks felt songwriters were getting a bad deal. So the MMA created this thing called the Mechanical Licensing Collective, the MLC. Okay, bringing it down, what's the MLC? Think of it as a massive database. Yeah. It tracks every song, who owns it, the works. Streaming services can go to the MLC, get the licenses they need, and actually pay the right people correctly. No more excuses for lost royalties. Exactly. But there's more. The MMA also tackled this weird issue, music recorded before 1972. Oh, yeah. Wasn't that a whole thing? Like, really old recordings weren't protected the same way? It was a mess. Patchwork of state laws, some recordings just in limbo. The MMA brought those pre-1972 recordings under federal copyright, Finally. So all those legacy artists, their work is finally getting recognized and protected properly. About time. Right. And then a couple of years later in 2020, the CASE Act gets passed. Yeah. That one was huge for independent artists. The CASE Act. Now, that one I really liked. Like the little guy finally getting some power. What made it so important? It gave them a way to actually enforce their copyrights without needing a million bucks and a legal team. Before, if someone infringed on your work, your only option was basically federal court. Expensive and intimidating, not exactly indie musician friendly. Exactly. So the CASE Act, it created this thing called the Copyright Claims Board. So instead of those huge court battles, there's a simpler option. Right. It's within the U.S. Copyright Office, less formal, way less expensive. For smaller cases, it's a way to actually get a resolution. It's like finally a system that works for musicians, not just lawyers. And that's really what it's all about, right? Yeah. Trying to make the system work for the people creating the art. Absolutely. We've covered a lot of ground here from sheet music to streaming, AI making beats. It's amazing how much things have changed. And the crazy thing is, it's still changing. What's next? Who knows? But that's what makes copyright so fascinating. Yeah. Trying to find that balance, protecting artists, but also letting creativity thrive. Couldn't have said it better myself. But now, I've got to ask, we've got AI writing songs now. Whose copyright is that even? Million dollar question, right. That's what everyone's trying to figure out. Is it the programmer who made the AI? the person who tells it what to write. It's making us rethink what creativity even means these days. Mind-blowing. So we started with sheet music, and now we're debating the soul of AI-composed symphonies. Talk about a deep dive. And it's not over yet. <laughs> That's the truth. 
All right, everyone, that's been our whirlwind tour of music copyright. Hope you're feeling a little more informed, a little more empowered. Big thanks to our expert for breaking it all down. Anytime. Wow, that is super fascinating. Super fascinating that both it sounds like just normal language speaking between two human beings and very little to indicate that it was artificially created. This technology is really starting to uh, mind boggle, amaze, and scare a little bit. But I think if we don't embrace at least understanding it a little bit and what it can do as a tool for all of us moving forward, I think we're missing the point of the evolution of some of the technology out there. I mean, granted, it can make some people lazy and it can make for subpar content for sure. But again, like I said, this is an experiment. I'll likely do this experiment again multiple times with subject matter that is complex. And I'd like to get a very concise and detailed uh, retrospective on it and kind of just get some more content out there utilizing some of these tools and getting a feel for what it is and and how it gets how it's perceived and how it's received really because I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that are jumping on the Suno and Udio bandwagon and just producing a ton a ton of music and not going back in and doing any kind of editing they're just taking you know it's it's WYSIWYG man it's what you see is what you get publish this stuff and I think they're creating something on their own, which to some degree they are. To some degree they totally are. They are using prompt engineering to create a style and music that they want to hear. However, not playing an instrument, not understanding the nuances of musicality and key signatures and tone and tempo and style and everything, I think you miss a big portion of the creative process. So I really feel like for some of those other people, that's going to, it's going to be a passe thing. It's going to be exciting for a while and then, you know, they'll kind of shelve it and not return to it or they'll use it within something else like within Camtasia or Canva or something to generate some simple music bed that they need. And it does the thing, you know, which is great, which is great. You know, it's another tool and it simplifies a process for people. That's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. I think the novel ideas, though, where you combine different styles and everything, you know, that's still that's still a very human thing. So, you know, I know this 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 whole podcast was actually about <laughs> copyright law, but it's uh, it, it, Copyright law is definitely spanning into this space, into this AI music produced space. So I think it's important to bring this up and it's more than likely going to be a non sequitur into one of my next episodes. And I'm going to actually delve into some of the, some of the tools that are out there and uh, talk about them and maybe even produce some stuff and play it as an example and talk about some of the nuance of those pieces of software and those technologies and the stuff I like about it and the stuff I don't. So um, thanks for tuning in for this episode on copyright. And I'm sure to have some more stuff coming down the pipeline. I'm going to try not to make it another three months, <laughs> try to make it a couple times a month and be consistent about it. But for everybody out there that enjoys this podcast and, and enjoys when new things drop. I appreciate you and I thank you and I'll see you next time on the Tim Kulig Free Music Podcast. Take care, guys. Bye.